Welcome back to 8 Minutes of Misery and Suffering from both yourself and those before you. Last time we focused on a grand empire, but today we focus on a mere six counties. But the events on the Emerald Isle between 1969 and 1998 are some of the most important for understanding the contemporary politics between the North, the South and the proverbial abusive stepfather. Ireland, for a long time, was the Celtic heartland. Lush, uncivilised and without alcohol licensing laws, it was almost a paradise for the indigenous people. Ignoring the famine, disease and overall low life expectancy, of course. It is a universal truth that exploitable places are exploited, and Ireland was no different. In the 17th century, Britain created plantations in Ireland in an attempt to colonise it and quell rebellion. However, taking land from someone and giving it to a stranger seems to make people more angry rather than less, go figure. And throughout the 17th to 19th century, rebellions occurred so frequently that only repeated natural disasters and genocide could keep them at bay. So, a rocky start to say the least, but Britannia was not put off. Relationships require understanding, and what better way for cultures to get to know each other than by sharing a religion? Forcefully, of course. We wouldn't want those potato peelers thinking they know better. The Irish, however, remain mostly Catholic, with only a few counties around the Ulster region having a significant Protestant population. There's no mystery as to why the Irish rejected the English. It has to do with a lot of people dying, a common theme in this series, in the potato famine. In 1845, potato blight spread across the land and wiped out the majority of the potato crop, on which much of Ireland was dependent. A million died and a million left. All in all, a quarter of Ireland's population were removed. This, combined with the previous famine, annihilated the once prosperous land. This created the perfect environment for violence, and Celts aren't exactly known for their diplomacy at the best of times. Thus, in 1921, after centuries of infighting and conflict, Ireland was granted independence. Is what should have happened. In actuality, Britain decided to hang on to the Ulster region for old times' sake, I guess. What could possibly go wrong? History is complicated. People are lazy. They look at the past like a night at the pub. No one's really sure what the circumstances were, but things happen, and now we're in A&E with a bandage and a good boy lollipop. It's easy to use Catholic and nationalist interchangeably, but this is a misnomer. Though many Catholics were nationalists, many were not, and the majority did not support the actions of the IRA. On the flip side, some Protestants formed groups like the Orange Order, whose goal seemed to be to cause incidents by marching through nationalist areas that clearly didn't want them. Catholics, however, were discriminated against quite heavily in the North in a way not too dissimilar to black segregation, though most of the control was due to the Unionist government gerrymandering. Britain, however, refused to let go, and whenever the Nationalists tried to get independence, Westminster popped in like a crazy ex and brought back all of the emotional trauma of the past. One practice that was particularly nasty was internment. You know how dictators in third world countries imprison people they don't like for arbitrary reasons? That was the Queen. Oh, Philip, why do the Irish hate me so? Well, Liz, obviously those ginger apes have no appreciation for what it means to be British, damn paddies. Never mind, Phil. I think I just figured it out. The interment reached its peak during Operation Demetrius. Demetrius must be Latin for take away and torture, because by and large, that's what happened. To no one's surprise but the English, this achieved nothing, caught hardly any insurgents, and pissed the Nationalists right off. The Nationalist forces gained new members through these martyrs and demanded self-governance more than ever, but the Parliament was dominated by the Unionists. This led to the IRA forming and taking the fight to the British, or at least some civilians nearby. The Provisional Irish Republican Army, or PIRA for short, was actually a shoot-off from the actual IRA, who were basically paddy communists and are about as well remembered as the Angry Birds movie. Henceforth, the PIRA will be known as the IRA for no other reason that's easier to say. The IRA organised and promoted guerrilla warfare against the Provisional Government and the British forces stationed there, who as per the general theme of this conflict, acted about as calm and collected as a rabid squirrel on a caffeine and cocaine induced rampage. Okay, some artistic liberties were taken, but you get the idea. The group gained traction after a number of instances of Britain fixing the problem. Bloody Sunday was one of the most famous of which. On January 30th, 1972, the people of Derry were out on a little stroll to tell their oppressed, uh, I mean government, that they would rather not live in fear of being snatched away in the middle of the night for going to the same pub as a terrorist. Okay, so a few of the rowdier members were throwing stones, but it was all in good fun, comparatively at least. 
British soldiers watching the protest decided it would be a good idea to shoot into the crowd to prevent further aggression or some such nonsense, and people died. Now I don't know about you, but if I were in a tenuous position of power over an angry mob, shooting a few for sport would not be my first priority. But after that and some dirty protests in prisons, the IRA gained enough support to feel they were able to throw their weight around a bit. I should be clear because you may get the impression that I have a rather poor opinion of the British in this conflict, and if not you should because I do. However, it is just as true that the IRA were a large-scale terrorist organisation that used car bombs and fear on civilians to get their way. They infiltrated and corrupted peaceful communities and protests and ruined the reputation of the Irish civil rights movement back in England. It wasn't just nationalists who drove people up the wall in an exploding car. The Ulster Defence Association decided it would be much more sporting to compete to see who could claim the most charred remains. The loser being, of course, the Irish. By this point, everyone had done enough of the whole bombing and blasting. When you've seen one pile of corpses, you've seen them all, that's what I always say. The Sunningdale Agreement was an attempt to install proportional representation to allow the Nationalists more of a say. It was a good idea, until the Unionists pointed out they were quite happy with the Nationalists not having much of a say, and they suggested that there was a problem with a small majority owning all the seats had obviously never read Kim's Guide to Democratic Justice with forward by Chairman Mao. The agreement failed when the UWC called a general strike in protest, though it was more like an airstrike considering the explosive result, and if you've been listening, you know that wasn't a metaphor. And, as a result, direct rule was imposed from Westminster. I don't need to tell you how this made the Irish feel, do I? Spoiler alert, they get upset. Hunger strikes also exacerbated tensions. Remember all those political prisoners generated from internment? Well, they weren't particularly happy about being incarcerated under dubious circumstances, especially since they were treated like people that had actually committed crimes. The IRA were also aggravated by this since most of the prisoners were or had become nationalists or nationalist sympathisers. The government refused to grant the victims of internment any of the rights usually associated with political prisoners, which only further weakened their increasingly tenuous position. Bobby Sands is a famous example who was part of the Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, and went on hunger strike with his fellow inmates to fight for his human rights, and even managed to get elected to Fermanagh, which is ironic considering politicians usually go to prison after they're elected. He then proceeded to starve to death to show just how faithful he was to his constituency. By now, the collective exasperation had reached critical mass, Good old Maggie T had become PM and decided that anyone north or west of Warwick would be much better off without government help. So, despite almost being killed by an IRA bomb the year before, she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. In theory, this gave the Republic an advisory role in the governance of the North and encouraged both sides to cool off for a little bit. There were further agreements after this, most notably the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, but this signifies the point where the British attitude changed from bloody foreigners to, well, I guess we're okay with that. Moves were made towards peace, and though a lot of animosity and bitterness is still felt today, it's improving, which is much more upbeat than how history usually plays out. But there you go. Sometimes things do turn out for the best. Most of the time they don't, though. So who was right? Was it the British forces with their arrogance, carelessness, and disregard for civilian casualties? Was it the Nationalist forces, with their spitefulness, subversion, and disregard for civilian casualties? Um, it's not looking good for either side, is it? I only ask a moral question because a practical one is easy. The morgues won, and everyone else lost. But the idea of right and wrong is a much more sticky issue. Both sides have sympathisers. Ireland have been oppressed by both the English and nature for centuries, and experiencing generations of death and betrayal, it's difficult to find an Irishman today who doesn't have a relative who was wronged by the Brits. Overall, they didn't have a good time of it and had a right to be angry. The British were also at fault for making numerous unnecessary mistakes in handling the issue of growing resentment, which disillusioned many of the Unionists and neutral parties. But, and it's a big, sweet, fine-ass but, you can't ignore the methods of the IRA and other violent groups. Many of the most vocal nationalists used terrorism to achieve their goals. People in contentious areas constantly feared being caught in the violence, and the events between 1968 and 1985 shaped the culture of Ireland for the worst for the next three decades. 
a lot of people died for nothing. There's also allegations that they sabotaged peaceful protests to agitate the police and military, creating martyrs. So, what can we conclude? Both sides are wrong? The ends justified the means? I don't have the answers, but if there was an easy solution, I wouldn't need to make this video, would I? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.